Because she has because she was being sassy and then that happened and I was like oh, she was really to Yeah, I would say like, what do you think is more important? I don't want to talk about it. starts. That's the speech I gave last night. We didn't really have much time. By the time we got there, Welcome to the evangelism class. Actually, it should be you that should be welcoming me because I, am, I have not been a part of your class. But uh, Sean has asked for me to uh, take over for today and Wednesday, and we'll be going over lesson number six. So far, you guys have been uh, talking about the importance of evangelism, um, the power of an invitation, right? That was the most recent lesson. The importance of, of cultivating the right soil, and leading by example, and keeping the fire uh, alive. But here's the question we also have. What do I say? I, I, I know I'm supposed to invite people. I know I'm supposed to evangelize. I know it's important, but what do I say? What do I say if there's an opportunity? What, what do I say, what do I talk about if someone is willing to have a Bible study with me? What do I say? Well, there's an answer to that. And we'll answer it. But first, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you for blessing us this day um, with life and this great opportunity to gather here to worship you and to learn more about you. Father, we, we are so thankful for your word that teaches us daily. Help us to always... Um, be your light in this dark world and uh, to always grow closer to you. Be with us as we study your word. May we leave this place edified. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what do I talk about if someone is willing to have a study with me? Well, you might say, well, there's so many things that we could talk about. There's so many topics. But I want to suggest to you there's, there's one thing that will always be the right answer. And that is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Evangelism is about preaching Jesus. Inviting people, it's about inviting them to Jesus. If you want to invite someone to church, you're, you're inviting them to listen to Jesus. If you want to have a Bible study, you don't know what to talk about, talk about Jesus. Because that's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. And that's exactly what Peter does in Acts chapter 3. And that was the first assignment that you had for, from your workbook. Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching to the Jewish uh, brethren in the temple at, at the portico uh, of Solomon or Solomon's porch. And in it, we find that Peter's main focus is Jesus. And in fact, Jesus, according to Peter, has more than one title. And that was your sign. So let's go over, let's go over what those six uh, titles or names 
that was Jesus assigned to Jesus' work. So who can tell me the very first one that he mentions? Peter. Okay. That would be the second one. Servant. There you go. God's servant. So what's interesting about that one is that not only is it the first one that he mentions, but it's also the last one. So verse 13... So Acts 3 and verse 13, Peter says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. Okay? Then look at verse 26. Verse 26, at the end of the chapter, he says, God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So why, why do you think this particular name uh, Peter mentions twice at the beginning and at the end? What's so significant about Jesus being the servant of God? Go ahead. It's very similar to how Jesus says, pray to the Father. Jesus, throughout his ministry, exalts the Father above him. And by going by this term servant, it shows that he is under the authority of the Father. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it reflects his obedience to the Father, which he did all his life. What are some examples you can think of, uh, of Jesus being the servant of God? Thy will, not mine. Thy will, not mine. Absolutely. What do you say? Uh, Jesus said, I have not come to be served, but to what? Serve. But to serve, but to give my life, right? That's what Jesus came, that's the, the ultimate example of Jesus' servanthood to, to God. It also reminds me of when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, right? He was a servant, not only of God's will, but he was a servant to everyone else, <coughs> right? Even his apostles. Remember what Peter said when he started to, to, to bend down and wash his, uh, his feet? He said, what are you doing, right? Jesus, I'm the one who's supposed to be washing your feet. And he said, I need to do this. I need to do this. He is God's servant. Um, any comments about that one? Go ahead. It also shows his humility. His humility, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Jesus is God in the flesh. And God doesn't, you don't think of God bowing, kneeling down and serving us. That's what Jesus did. Um, and he had to learn obedience. That takes humility. And Jesus was the ultimate example of that. What's the second name that we find Peter mentions? And holy and righteous. Holy and righteous, right. holy and righteous one. What does the what does the word holy mean? Set apart. Set apart, right? Set apart from from evil. Set apart. Uh, from darkness. Um, Jesus was set apart by the Father to come to this earth to save us from our sins. And righteous one, so that means that he embodies perfect justice and moral integrity. He's righteous. right? Don't we get upset when something that's unjust happens. I mean, that happens all over uh, in our country, all over the world. But Jesus is the ultimate example of righteousness, of justice. And that's what Jesus is referred to as by Peter, holy and righteous one. What's the, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out what can I preach to a lost person? Why would, 
preaching about Jesus as the holy and righteous one be useful in evangelism? Eventually you got to get to some point about how or why we're saved through him. Mm. Um, and I'm certainly not trying to be saved by someone who is not holy mm -hmm. or righteous. Mm -hmm. So That's a great point. Yeah. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. And that's a reason to believe in Jesus. Uh, think about other, other leaders of religious groups. Uh, think about um, Mormonism. Joseph Smith. Right? He was just a, a human being. He went to prison. He, he did lots of uh, bad things. He was an imperfect human being, yet they treated him as this great prophet. Right? Um, think about all the gods of the Greek mythology. Right? Zeus and them. They're supposedly gods, yet they act just like humans. They, they get into affairs. They, they lie. They stab each other in the back. How can I believe in a God like that? But when you preach about Jesus being sinless, being perfect, man, people, people's hopes, they, they start to lighten up. Because there is someone who can live this life perfectly, and that was Jesus, and he died so that we wouldn't have to suffer for our consequences. What's the, any, any other comments about this? What's the third name that we read about here that Peter mentions? The author of life. The author of life. What do you uh, extract from, from that name? What does that tell you about Jesus? He wrote the book on life. He wrote the book on life. He can give me eternal, eternal life. He can give me eternal life. So, author always makes me think of a book, right? And I think that's, that's the idea. If you were to write a, a book... Um, about whatever topic. Well, you have to do your research. You have to know everything about everything so that you could write a book and teach someone else. Well, if someone were to ask you, well, what is your book about? Well, you know everything about the book because you wrote it. And so God wrote the book of life. He is the creator. He is the one that gave us breath. Of life without him there is no life and so because he is the author of life he's the only one who can give us eternal life like Jesus said he's the only one um, what is known as the ultimate enemy of, of mankind what's our worst man's worst enemy sin, sin? Well, himself. that is true. <laughs> Are you looking for himself? <laughs> <laughs> that is also true. But in the world, I would say most people would, would think death mm -hmm. is the ultimate enemy, right? Because most people are afraid to die. Whether they, they admit it or not, people are afraid to die. And it's only when people come close to death uh, do they start to realize, man, maybe I need to, I need to think about eternity, right? Maybe I need to think about life after death. Is there life after death? Because when people are close to death, close to the enemy, they're, they're hopeless. They need something to, to ground themselves in. They need an anchor. And who else to go to than the author of life who promises eternal life? And that's Jesus. Jesus is the author of life. And also, where do we read about the creation of life? Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image. What does that tell you about Jesus? He was there in the beginning. 
Jesus was there, planning, making, breathing life into mankind. He is God in the flesh, and he is the author of life. And not only did he create life, but when he died, which he did on that cross, and that's what we remember every first day of the week, that's what we'll be doing, he also conquered death. Oh, man, that would give you hope. That would take the fear of death away. In fact, that's what a Christian should not fear at all, is death. Because death, like uh, Brother Roger Shaw says when he, when he came and preached to us, he said, death is just a door. That's, this is a door to life. When I was a baby, when I was born, I w walked in through that door. There's death. I'm leaving through that door just into the other room, just into eternity. It's just a door. Death is just a door. And the one that promises life after, when I go through that door, is Jesus, the author of life. What's the next, uh, any other comments about that, actually? Okay. Number four, who, what other name do we, do we have for Jesus in uh, Peter's sermon? The Christ. His Christ. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's, let's write down his, but also the. Because we see actually, we see both. Oh, so, sorry, he also calls the Lord. Lord, that's right. And notice what it says in verse 18. So, Acts 3 and verse 18 says, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Then drop to verse 20. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So it says both, his Christ and the Christ. What does this, what does the word Christ mean? Anointed one. The anointed one, the chosen one. Right? God's chosen one. That's what His Christ means. God chose His only Son and the chosen one for us. This tells us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Because it was prophesied that Jesus, or that a Messiah, a Christ, a chosen one, was to come to earth and redeem Israel and save his people. And that Christ is the Christ that the Jewish nation was waiting for. And when Jesus came, is it who they expected? Is Jesus who they expected? No. Why, why, what were they looking for? Yeah, they were looking for physical. Uh, who are they being oppressed by at that time? The Romans. The Romans. And man, imagine every day being uh, oppressed by Romans. Waking up, not knowing if, if uh, they're going to knock at your door, take everything from you, tax you more than you can handle. Uh, you're working every day and you know maybe all of this might go to the Romans. I might not even be able to feed my own family. And, and they're looking forward to the Christ. Man, gee, this Christ is going to, he's going to come. He's going to uh, get rid of the Romans. And I can, we can live in peace again. I can't wait. Oof. When Jesus comes, and when he enters Jerusalem on a, on a donkey, and when he's got nowhere to lay his head, when he's got no army, just 12 old dis disciples that were fishermen, some of them, and yet he claims to be the Christ, the chosen one, the Messiah. Oh, that can't be the Messiah. He doesn't look the part. He's not going to save us. He's not going to redeem us from the Romans. But this is the Christ. The Christ that came to earth, the chosen one that died on the cross to save us. 
Any comments about that? How could this be used to uh, teach or preach to a person who's lost? That's, uh, that's our goal, evangelism. Why is preaching Jesus as the Christ important? <coughs> Yes. I think this is a helpful one with um, people who might have a slightly different view of like who Jesus was, because mm. it, like, if they, especially if they like believe the Old Testament, but maybe, like, for example, Mormons, if they yeah. think like John Smith could have been mm. a prophet, prophet, then it's like, okay, hold on, Jesus was the chosen one. Let's see what he says and what happens in the New Testament. We see that that there is not going to be anyone after him, you know, like. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great, just like the Jews had a, a, an idea of what the Christ was. Well, the Bible tells us exactly what the Christ is all about. And if someone has a different idea of who Jesus is, we can show them, no, no, this is what the chosen one is supposed to be like. Yes, Lance. With, with Catholicism, mm -hmm. if you can remove the stature of the Pope, the entire religion will fall. Yeah. And in here, this Christ is singular. There's mm -hmm. no need to have his representative on earth. Why would we want that when he is the high priest serving in the spiritual temple in heaven? Absolutely. So with Catholicism, mm -hmm. this is the, that, that's the chink in the armor that you have to make them have an aha. Absolutely. And he, how many times did he have to die for it? Only once. One Jesus, one Lord, one God, and it was one sacrifice. To him. Once and for all, the book of Hebrews says. Once and for all. And Jesus is the chosen one, the Christ. Not one of many, the only one. Okay. What's the next one? Lord, I think, uh, John, that that's uh, pretty s similar to um, Christ or um, to other ones that we'll talk about. Okay. Son of the prophet. Yes, prophet. In fact, we only had six bulletins, so if you wanted to add Lord, that could could have <laughs> added a little dot there. But um, yes, so prophet, right? You know who else thinks uh, Jesus is a prophet? The Muslims, right? But what do we understand by Jesus being a prophet? That he was that prophet. Uh, that he was that prophet. <laughs> what that prophet are you talking about? The one that Moses was talking about. The, Mo the one that Moses was talking about, right? A prophet like Moses. What does that make you think of? Uh, what, what kind of prophet was Moses like? Yes, Lance. The idea was he was going to be the lawgiver. Ah, the lawgiver, right? What do you think of when you think of the Old Testament? The law of what? Moses. The law of Moses. And I guess in a similar way, you could you could say that the New Testament is the, the law of Jesus, right? The grace of, of Jesus. So he is the prophet. What do prophets do? They prophesy, right? <laughs> and where, who gives them that prophecy? God. God. So what they're doing is they're speaking for God, right? They're speaking what God wants them, the message that God wants his people to hear. That's what the prophets do. And what happened to a lot of the prophets when they preached what, Jesus, what God wanted them to hear? They were killed. Yes, people don't like the truth, right? Prophet today sounds like a, a cool profession, but guess what? In the, in the Bible times, being a prophet, that's a dangerous, dangerous uh, person to be, right? A prophet. Because you have to, you have to uh, teach the message of God. But most of the time, when there's a need for a prophet, it's because the people are, are doing something wrong, right? They're doing something wrong. 
and a lot of them were chased, right? They were persecuted, and a, they were, a lot of them were killed. And guess what? Jesus was also. Jesus was persecuted. Jesus was ridiculed. He, they did not want to hear what Jesus' message it was from God, and they crucified him. He was the prophet. Not only, not only do they give the message from God, but they call people to repentance. They call people to repentance. Remember uh, Jonah, one of the prophets in the Old Testament? He, he had to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to. He said, I know what kind of God you are, that you're merciful and you're full of grace. And I know that if I preach to them and they repent, you will forgive them. Right? That was his problem because he, he didn't like that God could forgive such an evil nation like the Ninevites. But God is a God of forgiveness. And when he finally ended up preaching to the Ninevites, guess what they did? They repented. He preached repentance to them, and they listened, and God forgave them. That's what a prophet does, is they preach the message, and they preach repentance to people. Jesus did that very same thing when he was here on earth, and he, he teaches us every day. The message of God and the message of Repentance. Uh, anyone have a comment about that? That was awesome. Okay. Lastly, what is the last name that we see for Jesus? And I'll give you a hint. It's in verse twenty-five. Uh, that would. What was that? The seed. Okay. Yes. The seed, or some of your translations might have the offspring. Okay. So, I'm going to put uh, the seed, okay, or the offspring. <laughs> what does that mean? Who's offspring? Who's seed? Anyone? The MVP, Abraham. Of, MVP of Israel. That's right. Abraham, the, the father of the Jewish nation, right? He is the guy. It's Abraham. And what is significant that Jesus is referred to as the seed or the offspring of Abraham? Why is it significant in this context? Yes? It fulfills God's promise. It fulfills God's promise. And who is he speaking to specifically here? Peter is. The offspring of Abraham, right? He's saying, Jesus is, is one of you. Jesus was a, a des descendant of Abraham. He's a Jewish uh, descendant, right? And what that makes you realize is God's plan was fulfilled through Jesus, right? How many times do we read about in the Old Testament of this Messiah that was going to come through uh, a, a prophet like Moses, right? But we also read um, through this a descendant, son of David, right? Descendant of David. And is Jesus a descendant of David? Absolutely. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But Abraham's offspring means he is the fulfillment of God's promises. What were, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, what were the three promises? that God gave to Abraham? Land, nation, seed. Seed being Jesus. So, since way back when, God knew Jesus was going to come through Abraham. Yes? I think it's also significant that he's dropping all these names like Samuel and Moses mm. like to really drive home that, hey, this is the prophet. This is the most important one. You guys should know about him. We, we've talked about him a That's lot. That's right. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I think that he's really driving home that Jesus is who it's been all about, which is what we always stress. The whole Bible is about Jesus. So, mm -hmm. I'm really setting him up. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's like like saying, uh, do you know who Abraham Lincoln was? 
Or do you know who uh, George Washington was, right? These important figures in our history, well, for them, Abraham was, was the guy that everyone, the little kids, they all knew who Abraham was. And he is trying to connect with the Jews. Jesus is just like you, okay? Awesome. Any other comments about that? Okay, yes, go ahead, Kimberly. Uh, what translation are you using? Because, like, King James Version doesn't use servant. No. Okay, what, what word does it use? It, 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 it just does it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm using the English Standard Version. Oh, okay. Uh, how does yours read? Um, let's see. Let's say verse, uh, Three, verse 13. Verse 13. Yeah. Acts 3, 13? Yes. Uh, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered okay. up and denied him in the presence of Pilate mm -hmm. when he was returned to let him go. So there are some manuscripts that use the word servant, and there are others that use the word uh, child, right, or son. So, but it, the idea is still the same. He is the servant of God. But he's also the, the son of God. Um, either one, um, the message does not, uh, is not altered or is not taken away. Okay. And that's, that's what's so cool about uh, manuscripts is that some say one thing, some say the other. And people see this as a, as a contradiction. But the reality is it doesn't change the message, right? Whether it's just a, a word here or there. That it could be this word, it could be this word, and lots of scholars may agree one one way or the other, but the message is is still the same. Okay. Um, okay. So now let's move on to the next point. So now we're gonna go into a little bit more specifics. But let me ask the question: Why does Jesus have so many titles, so many names? Why do you think he, he's got so many names? He's a complex person. He's a complex person. Uh, yes, John. I think God wants us to know. There's so many things that he wants us to know what those things are. Yeah. And this is just some of them. There's much more than this. Think about, think about your relationship with other people. To you, you could be someone's father. You could be, or mother, you could be someone's brother or sister. You could be someone's uh, son or daughter. You could be someone's boss or co-worker. Uh, you could be uh, someone's classmate, someone's teacher or student, but you're still the same person, okay? Jesus has all these different titles each represent or tells us about a different aspect of Jesus, different characteristic, but he's still the same person, right? Uh, Jesus, the seed, is the same as Jesus, the author of life. And Jesus, the author of life, is the same as Jesus, the prophet. But each one tells us a little bit more about Jesus. We get to know him a little bit better, right? Go ahead, Lance. It's almost like his uh, pedigree or his resume. Ah, his resume, right? How do, you, how do you hire people? You have to look through the resume. The more impressive it is, the more likely it is you'll, you'll get hired. Well, this is the most impressive resume. Line one created the world. That's right. <laughs> the creator of the universe, right? But he's not applying to a job, right? He's not applying to any job or any role. What we're trying to do is show people who they should believe in, right? And who can save them. And this is his resume, right? This is his resume. Now, we can also say each aspect of Jesus can be tailored to a different person, right? Um, everyone, when we preach to someone, we have to know who they are. We have to know uh, what their background is. Right? What are they struggling with? Of course, they're all lost, but maybe they're lost and 
but with different backgrounds, different pasts, different struggles, different questions. So if a person maybe is feeling hopeless, you can tailor your teaching about Jesus to address that specific uh, situation, that specific problem that they're going through, right? If they're more concerned about um, the future, right, the, it's uncertainty, maybe you can talk to them about how Jesus, Jesus never, uh, never breaks his promises, right? Just an example. But Jesus has many different names, not only to show us who he is, but that Jesus is the Lord and Savior for everyone. Everyone, no matter what they need, right? Okay, so, not everyone is seeking initially the same thing, but eventually we'll all come to Jesus as the answer, okay? So now let's go to the second point, uh, the second assignment you guys had in our lesson. So now I want to ask a question. What is better to teach with, let's say you're having a Bible study. Is it better to teach from a, a book, start from the beginning of a book, go through the book and, and have a class on that? Or teach uh, based on a topic? Yes? I think it really depends on what they need to hear. <laughs> yes, that was my answer. It depends. What right? an engineering answer. That's right. <laughs> Lance would know. No, so, an engineer. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It depends, right? Everyone is different, like we just discussed. So, um, maybe, like one time, I had a Bible study on the book of Ecclesiastes because this person wasn't even sure if God existed. What a great book to start with, okay? Um, now, maybe their question is more about um, who Jesus is than in that in that regard, you can go to several different places, right? You go back and forth, or you can go through a book and learn about Jesus that way. It just depends, but you have to know who you're talking to, who your audience is, and there really is no right way to do, to preach uh, about, well, there is a wrong way to preach if you don't preach about Jesus correctly, but as long as you're preaching the right Jesus, it doesn't really matter, right? There's different ways to do. There is no one way. There is no one way. Okay. So let's say, let's say we we want to use the gospel or the three the three promises of God that were given to Abraham. Okay. Um, what can we learn about Jesus in these with these three promises? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't raise no, my hand. no, no, it's okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Jesus was thinking about us from the beginning. Go ahead, John. I always think about those as according to the spiritual promises. The land mm -hmm. according to heaven, the nation according to the church, and and seed would be him. Yes. And, and the means of that. Exactly. And you know what? I think most people in the world struggle with making connections from the physical to the spiritual, okay? Even in the religious world today, they go to the Old Testament and they read things like, um, you will never want, or, or um, uh, what was that verse? It, it talks about how um, God has a plan for you, right? And that nothing bad will happen to you, that God will always be with you, and they mean that to say, well, God means you'll never need anything, right? You'll never struggle. God will always be with you. Well, that's not necessarily the case. He's talking more spiritually, right? Uh, the Jews even had this problem. They were thinking of a physical deliverer of their, uh, the oppression that they were suffering, but they were making the spiritual connection, okay? The three promises that were made to Abraham, they are meant to be a spiritual connection. And like Gigi said, God was thinking about us from the beginning. Man, time flies. Okay, so 
Here's what I, what we learn about Jesus. And for all of these, Jesus is going to be in this statement. So Jesus, as God's plan for you. Okay? Jesus as God's plan for you. That's what we learn from these three promises. Um, think about someone maybe that you know that uh, maybe they don't have much family. Maybe they don't think that they're important in life, that they have many friends. Maybe they don't feel like they're important. If they know the God of the universe, the creator, was thinking about them since the beginning of time, well, what would that do to a person? They, wouldn't they, they feel con a connection? Wouldn't they feel interested in learning about this person that, that thought about me? Right? Jesus has God's plan for you, right? Think of all of these as tailored to a specific person. God has a plan for you. And we read about it in the Bible, and it's fulfilled through Jesus. The promises that were made to Abraham, they're found in Jesus. They're found in Jesus. Um, we could think about someone who's seeking <coughs> purpose. Right? Someone who's seeking purpose. Someone who's seeking rest. God promised a land that they would go to that, that flows milk and honey. Well, if we talk about heaven, that's a place of rest. Someone who's seeking blessings. right? Maybe their life has been full of uh, lots of struggles, lots of difficult moments, lots of death. Maybe they're seeking something positive, blessings. God promised blessings for all the nations through Jesus Christ. Okay, So we learn through the, the three promises that were made to Abraham and Jesus as a plan for you. For you. Okay. Um, now, what about the Gospel of Matthew? What do, what, and notice how we have all four Gospels, right? And you might think, well, they're pretty similar, which they are. They all talk about Jesus' ministry and, and his life here. But every author, because that's what they are, they're authors of these Gospels, they have a different purpose behind why they're writing this. They want to get an idea across. Of course, it's about Jesus, but a different aspect about Jesus. So specifically, what do you think... The Gospel of Matthew is trying to address or trying to teach its audience. Anyone? Go ahead, Lance. We, we talked about it earlier. Um, Matthew is written to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about it earlier how Moses says, look for that lawgiver. That's right. And Matthew says, here he is. So, Matthew, we can learn Jesus. as the long-awaited Messiah. Like Lance said, this is written to the Jews. He knows his audience. Matthew does. And they know the prophecies. They know the Old Testament. They're, you know, he's speaking to people who are very, very familiar with the old law and all the prophecies about the Messiah and like like Lance said Matthew says here he is it's Jesus the guy you're looking for he's here he's the one that you crucified this is what we can learn from the gospel from Matthew for example Matthew chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 it says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And it says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That prophecy is in Isaiah. 
Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Matthew 2, verse 6 uh, says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That prophecy found in Micah. We, found, we find the same thing, Matthew 2, verse 15, which is a prophecy that is made in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And in Matthew 21, we read about a prophecy that Zechariah gave in Zechariah 9 and verse 9. The point is, all the prophets talked about the Messiah that was to come. And Jesus fulfills all those prophecies. And so, Jesus is that long-awaited Messiah. We'll continue the rest of this tomorrow and the rest, or not tomorrow, Wednesday, and the rest of Lesson 6 as well.